I'm going to be switching into Spanish now. So if you are an English speaker, make sure that you've hit interpretation and that you're on the English channel. If you have any issues, uh, you can send them in the chat to the general chat or to Savannah and we'll help you figure it out. So voy a cambiar al español. Bienvenidos a todo el mundo. Welcome to everyone. We are here today with a, continuing our series of the co-op clinics from the Federation of Worker-Owned Cooperatives in the United States. I'm Kate. I'm the manager of membership. And today we are continuing with our series that address the fundamentals of workplace democracy. And we're speaking specifically today about structures and decision making. Next slide, please. So just to review a little bit how we're going to spend the next hour in a little bit, we will be talking a little bit about the governance structures. Then we'll talk about management structures. I also uh, will uh, be talking about decision making process and what can be helpful for the process of making decisions. Then we'll talk a little bit from our colleagues from the movement, Bonfire Media Collective and also Percolab Co-op. And there will be a space at the end of the program so that there can be questions and we can have a little bit of conversation amongst us. And then there will be a closing where we are wrapping up where we make some announcements. As the majority of you hopefully know by now, the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives in the United States our, our um, initials in English are USFWC, and we are the only national grassroots membership organization for Walker Cooperatives in the United States. Next slide. One of the big parts of the Federation's work is to create systems of technical support for our member cooperatives and the cooperatives in our movement. And one of those spaces where we offer that space is called the co-op clinic. The co-op clinic is a network of peer advisors and also a space where we give workshops and classes in order to offer education to ourselves and to others. This session that we're doing today is a session among a series that we've been doing with the co-op clinic. And when you become members of the Federation, you can take advantage of this consistent support through the co-op clinic uh, based on the questions that you might have of how to support and um, expand your cooperative. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about who our invited guests are today. We have a super team of people who will be sharing their experiences as cooperative worker owners. Our colleague, Esther West, is visiting us from Madison, Wisconsin. She has five years of firsthand experience as a worker owner in one of the largest cooperatives of worker owners in the United States, which is called Equal Exchange. And currently she is a worker owner of the Ajani Cooperative. She's also worked as a cooperative development specialist at the University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives where she was able to support, provide technical assistance to cooperatives, did an investigation of, of other cooperatives. She's also part of the MadWork co uh, Worker Cooperative Board, which is a group at, in Madison, Wisconsin of worker cooperatives. And we have the honor to count, on, to count her as the vice president of the board of USFWC. Next slide. 
And I should say that Esther is presenting and moderating the conversation. To, moderating the conversation, we also have Samantha Slade with us. She is from the Co-op Perco Lab. She is from the Perco Lab Cooperative, which is based in Montreal, Canada. She's an author and a collective entrepreneur. She wrote a book called Going Horizontal or creating non-hierarchical organizations one practice at a time. This book focuses on the work of starting with oneself, making small practices that lead us to system change. Samantha has developed many, has been a, a trainer and a professor and what is the, the decision making for discernment and systemic change. Next slide, please. We also have the presence of Alex Wiles with us. He is from the cooperative here in the city where I live in Philadelphia, which is called Bonfire Media. Alex is a filmmaker, videographer, and photographer from Philadelphia. He's been making media and organizing, mobilizing project since 2010. Alex has worked with the American Friends Service Committee, with Neighborhood Bike Works, and with the Philadelphia Zoo. And he is also a worker owner of Bonfire Media Collective. Next slide, please. And we also have Ben Felker Quinn. Ben Felker Quinn is an educator, media maker, and poet. He's a media literacy member at the same cooperative as Alex. He teaches media literacy in Philadelphia School District with the organization called Why. And he has participated actively in solidarity movements with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers in Florida and also with the anti uh, prison organizations in Philadelphia. And I think we can start now. So I would like to pass the mic now to Esther. Thank you to all for who got here today and to share this space. We invite you all to put your questions in the chat and we will gather them up so that we can have a conversation at the end amongst all of us. So now I turn it over to Esther. Hey everyone. And thank you, Kate, for the nice intros. And uh, it's an honor to get to be here with the Federation and also with all of you as worker owners and people involved in this movement. Um, before we dive in to structures, we want to point out there's a mini guide on worker co-op structures and decision making process, um, which is at this link here. So you can delve into these if you want to read more about them later as well. And as we look at governance structures, I'm going to, I'm just going to briefly stop screen sharing. Um, so I'll get back in a second here. Um, but, you know, as, just to contextualize some of this work, as a worker owner, you have a sense of pride and ownership over your work and your business. You also have a say and a voice. So, Structures, personalities, management versus governance structure, board versus worker owner body, et cetera, are all things to be aware of that impact the ability, the ability of worker owners to be both a strong worker and a strong owner. So in thinking about some of, you know, in thinking about governance structures, uh, you want to think about how do structures reflect our values? How do structures reflect power dynamics around topics that can impact us and our co-ops? You know, there might be some unlearning of power dynamics that we've learned since we were young in the society and some relearning of what it means to be a worker owner together in a co worker co-op. 
And how do stru governance structures also work for our business so that we can be dynamic and get things done and accomplished, right? Um, so today we're going to look at several governance structures and types of structures um, and hear from some amazing co-ops like uh, Kate, Kate has introduced us. So, uh, yeah, so each co-op's different. So worker owners need to tailor how you engage with each other through governance. Um, so just keep some things to keep in mind while we're looking at these different options. And let's go back to the slide. Can you all see that? Okay, cool. So to start, one type of governance is a collective. So collectives are where all members have equal governance power. This structure is usually found in small co-ops, smaller co-ops that aim for very little hierarchy. So for example, in the 80s when Equal Exchange started, they acted more like a collective where everyone was in the room making decisions together. But as they grew, they realized it was harder and harder to have everyone in the room and not everyone had to be there for every single decision. So they broke up their, they changed their governance structure a little bit. And if your legal statute, so each co-op is incorporated at the state level under these statutes, right? If it requires you to have a board, most often all members are automatically members of the board in a collective. And common decision-making processes and collectives are modified consensus, pure consensus, or majority vote. So pure consensus is where everyone decides, modified is where uh, it, it can vary a little bit, but maybe not everyone has to decide everything, uh, like it might not have to be 100% or Maybe um, it is in increments, like the decision-making process is in increments, or majority vote is, you know, what it sounds like. So what's the majority? Another type of governance is sociocracy or holacracy. And uh, I might not be saying that right. I'm sorry. If I'm not. Um, uh, I like it though. Uh, and so these are structures that focus on empowered circles or committees. So they can include a representative governance circle that functions much like a board. It's a form of modified consensus, consensus decision-making that is consent-based. And so you see in that graphic there, it's very like circular. And so you'll have like circles of decision-making that, that can be responsible for different parts of the co-op. And people can change at time, like which circles sometimes too, so that they are on. And then those come back to the broader group, okay. And co-ops under this form that have an elected board empower this governing body to differing degrees. You can make it work for your co-op. Some co-ops, some co-op boards maintain significant shared governance with members, often including monthly, quarterly, or very active annual member meetings. So, you know, what works for your co-op? An elected board is another type of governance structure and co-ops that have an elected board empower this governing body to different degrees. It depends. I've seen a lot of different ways this can look. And so some co-op boards maintain significant shared governance with members, often including monthly, quarterly, or very active annual member meetings. So you may have an elected board, which can be all worker owners, or you might have what's called outside board members who maybe you, maybe your co-op could use a little expertise in an area or a partnership development. So you get someone else outside of your co-op on the board. That's called an outside board member. Usually this will be stated in your bylaws too, whether or not you can have outside board members and how many. Um, and then there are also, um, so sometimes besides the board, there are also member, member, um, bodies, right. That can also make decisions for member, the mem from a member body perspective. And so boards are often empowered to create policy, lead strategic planning, set an annual budget, coordinate between teams, and oversee a general manager if the co-op has one. 
So the co-op manager or CEO or president on the, which is on the operations side of the co-op may report back to the governance side, the board, um, if, that's, if that's been requested. Co-ops with an elected board and shared governance often use modified consensus or a majority vote decision-making processes. So with larger co-ops, they often will retain less governance decision-making power for members beyond electing the board and ratifying major decisions at annual or special meetings. These co-ops usually have CEOs or managers that are hired, fired, and overseen by the elected board, usually with majority vote decision-making processes. And so, you know, with larger co-ops, you can still have democratic areas broken up, but it turn, often it'll turn into a little bit more, a little stronger delineation between the governance and the operations side. So management structures. So we talked a little bit about this, but whereas boards or general circles like with sociocracy are in charge of governance, management is in charge of day-to-day -day operations. So, so yeah, so, and sometimes I can't, it's not always totally clear what that is, but those are general principles, right? So you have governance of the co-op and, and then day-to-day -day operations. And decision-making processes are, it's really important to have uh, clarity um, some other best practice, some best practices around decision making processes are having a clear written process. So you got to write it down so people are all on the same page. You're looking at the same thing. You want to practice the decision making often, even when people are in agreement. So that when there's disagreement, the process, the process itself doesn't trip you up. That's really important, especially for co-ops that are getting started. You know, oftentimes. You may be with a group of people and you are all on the same page. You're like, why would we disagree? Like we're, we're doing fine. Um, so you may not go through these formal processes um, or it may seem like it's not worth the time, but it actually is because once you start to disagree, you'll be thankful to have these like this practice set up. And so train yourselves and refresh yourselves regularly on democratic decision-making and the accompanying topic, meeting facilitation. Meeting facilitation is absolute, absolutely crucial to have good practices and, and clarity and make sure everyone's on the same page. And you can map out who makes what type of decision using a decision-making chart and governance matrix and I know there are a lot of great resources at the Federation and DAWI as well. Um, before, so, so yeah, uh, we'll, we'll go over some upcoming events soon, but I'd like to turn it over to, I'm going to stop sharing and I'd like to turn it over to our wonderful uh, co cooperators. Um, yeah, uh, Alex, Samantha and Ben. And I was wondering if you could each just share your insights on governance and what you do, what your co-op does and anything else you'd like to share in relationship. So let's start with Samantha. Hi. Wow, so thanks for sharing that. I feel like the first thing I wanna say is I wanna, um, when I think about governance and the principle of, um, horizontal leadership and shared leadership. And I think about decision-making. For me, one of the things that's really important is that um, size doesn't matter. So that functioning in these democratic ways with collective um, shared leadership processes. For me, I work in the world of the self-management organization movement. And so Percolab Co-op, we help even large international organizations bring this decision-making space into something that's very collective and functional. 
and efficient. And within Purple Lab Co-op, we function as a lab. We have for 15 years and our decision-making structure is really held by two practices, I would say. Um, one is having a decision-making log. So any governance decisions that are made go into a really something very simple. It's basically a Google spreadsheet. And in it, it, it will have like the date, we know who's on like around, who was present and, 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 the, and the links to whatever appropriate documents are there. But anybody can access that. And when you join the co-op, then you have instant access to the entire registry of all the history of decisions from the board. And it's something very powerful to come in with that full transparency of decisions and know where you can go if you've been away or you're coming back or whatever. So that log holds that in a way. And the other part that we have on the other end is um, a process. Like, as you said, you need a process to hold yourselves together. So we have one, it's called generative decision making. I'm going to put the link in the chat. Um, it's a process when people come on board, they actually kind of experience that practice for a while. And it is disconcerting because it flips things around and it's based on three principles. And so it has the principle on it of life. So how do we be together and make a decision that doesn't have to be consensus where we're all on board? It can be just good enough for now, safe enough to try. We all acknowledge that decisions are never perfect. So what we're trying to do is just get decisions that keep us in movement and flow. And so this, this is a, is a, it's a, it's not a consensus based decision where everybody needs to be on board, but it needs to be validated by everybody to say that we don't see in this in this proposal anything that can cause harm or backward movement to the co-op. And if we establish there isn't that, then it's good enough to, to, to go, which really shifts the your decision making culture. So that's the first thing and it has life. The second thing has purpose because what it does as a process is it helps us really stay focused on the purpose behind the decision. We often start with a question, we go through, and, and I won't get into the details of it unless anybody wants to, but you could read up on it uh, all there um, in the link and you can find out more in all different places. And the third thing that it does is it builds a sense of belonging. So people's voices are heard in a really very structured way, but without having conversations and spinning out into lengthy things that we're all kind of don't want to go into with lengthy consensus processes. So we're in a process that's at the same time, both collective and keeps us in movement and doesn't burn us out in, in, in long and lengthy decisions. Sometimes on occasion, there are ones that can take quite some time, but, but when we develop this culture of um, being able to no longer be trying to push my idea on the other people and being in that collective space, it completely transforms everything. So our, those are the two, I would call them the bookends that we have at Purple Lab for our decision-making system and the governance builds out from there. Excellent, thank you. And that's a great link in chat. Thank you, Samantha. And yeah, next up, we'll hear from, let's hear from Bonfire. So we can start with uh, Alex or Ben. Do either of you want to go first? Uh, sure, um, I can go first. Uh, thanks for having us. And um, uh, in general, I would say that a really important part of what that was mentioned earlier was about um, unlearning lots of things, especially if it's your first time in a cooperative environment. There's a lot of systems that we are raised inside of that we are uh, that we trust to teach us that maybe don't teach us the best ways to cooperate with each other in the first place or even know what a co-op is. Before we um, started Bonfire, I actually didn't know what a co-op was. And it was only through being able to trust new, newer or at least different education systems and other tools and communities that we were able to build Bonfire, especially with the help of the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance. And in general, it was just really helpful to be able to lean on other communities that I hadn't been connected with before which I guess is what's happening right now in this moment. So I'm really thankful for that also. Uh, ben, do you have uh, anything to add? Yeah, just to say thanks to everyone for, for having us here. Um, 
where um, yeah, yeah, Bonfire is like a relatively new co-op. So a lot of this stuff is, we're just like kind of figuring it out. So I would echo what Alex said about unlearning. A lot of the context organizationally that we were bringing to our co-op was coming from the nonprofit industrial complex. So there's like, you know, there's a lot there to kind of unearth. Um, but I think, yeah, there's, there's, we're pretty small as a collective. There's only four of us right now um, who are kind of part of the inner circle. Um, so we're working by modified consensus as what Esther just um, presented. Um, but we're also thinking about, you know, like how power dynamics function amongst us. And also we just brought a new person in. So thinking about kind of how, yeah, just how new people bring um, kind of new questions to the table in terms of sharing what's already happened, um, as, as you also mentioned, Samantha. Um, so yeah, so glad to be here and glad to be thinking about this with you all. But yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah, well, I, I hear you, Alex, when you mentioned the peer to peer learning. I think that's one of the biggest things that helped me helps me um, with with cooperative, you know, learning what it means to be a worker owner. Like, I remember, you know, when I was at Equal Exchange, we'd have guest speakers and or reach out to others at conferences like the Federation conference, you know, always great. And uh, it was always just so good to hear what others are doing and then say, you know, I really like that. I could use that in my co-op or, you know, this is good, but I don't need to use that, you know, so I, I appreciate that point. Um, let's see here. I was wondering, um, what, what do your boards, like how many people, I know this is like kind of a basic question, but how many people are on your boards and for each co-op and do you have outside board members or not? Um, we could start with uh, maybe with Ben. Do you want to kick it? I'll kick it to you. Uh, sure, that's an easy question. We we don't have a board, so. Oh, okay. Sorry, I I didn't mean to miss that. <laughs> My bad. Um, so, what does can you articulate a little more about what your governance structure looks like or decision making looks like? Sure, and Alex, if you want to fill in too um but yeah we we have we just like we wrote some bylaws um we have some of that decision making structure kind of spelled out um in those bylaws there's some things that we need hey ben and you're cutting out a little bit um, it might help if you turn off your this video. Total consensus, but the gen amongst the us. Is that is that any better? If not, I would defer to Alex. I think I can actually hear you pretty clearly now that you have your video off, Ben. Okay, sorry about that. Um, what was I saying? Uh, bylaws. We have bylaws. We have some points where we need um, like a unanimous decision from everyone. And some of our, like for instance, bringing on a new member um, or a new worker owner. Um, but by and large, um, our decision-making process usually happens by consensus during meetings. Um, and we, we use a standard agenda, which kind of helps, like we have standardized various like our agenda and our facilitation we exchanged amongst ourselves um but yeah I, I guess in terms of who's making decisions um the four of us always are um during during our weekly meetings alex would you add anything to that yeah sure uh in general it's very simple uh it's it's just as ben said very consensus based and a lot of that is built around our bylaws, which we spent a very, very, very long time putting together. And through that are able to accelerate the consensus process somewhat. And in our bylaws, it says that we have to reach what's called quorum, which is just the amount of people 
at which point it is okay to make a decision, which in our case is just 75%. Um, in general, if there is a very important decision, such as spending a large amount of money or inviting a new member, then pretty much in that case, everyone would, would have to agree, or at least there should be more time to build further consensus, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. In general, we're pretty lucky because most of us are pretty aligned. So there's not really huge uh, disagreements about, about things usually, but in general it is voting and people get to have time to make a campaign for what they want to vote for. If they want a new piece of equipment or a new member or something, then we make space for the person to talk about it and try to be really deliberate about listening to it. Excellent, thank you. Samantha, do you have anything to add or share? Um, so our board here in Montreal is 10 people. By law in Quebec, when you have a cooperative, it has to have a board and we have to make an annual um, collective decision that everybody is part of the board unless there's a good reason for them not to be either there's a breach in trust or there's something going on where they it's not appropriate. So we have like a, by default, you're part of the board unless there's something specific going on. And we have to agree to that every year. We're, we are multiple Percolabs in multiple jurisdictions. And so each Percolab has its own board in its jurisdiction. And then we have a more informal way of getting together. That is not a formal board per se, because there is no international legal system <laughs> binding us in that place. So that place we can be a little bit more experimental. One thing that we have done in the board though, because we have this principle of life that's really important for us. And we know that the way boards are set up is usually you have like really strict times for board meetings and whatnot going on. And that sometimes those opportunities for decisions are happening more, more organically in, in either a team meeting or a team day or a retreat, times that might not be considered an official board meeting. Well, we, we allow board decisions to be made in all those different spaces. It's something that we experimented to see if that would work well, and we've kept it going for years. And so when we somebody feels like there's a decision, we go, oh, I have a proposal, and somebody goes, oh, can I host a generative decision-making process? And then we all know that what's going on. As soon as somebody says, can I host a generative decision-making process, that means we're in a, a board decision, and then we, we run it, and then somebody documents it. And so because we have that so strong, even though there's an official board, roles it's very very i don't know organic how it functions which also means that with our process we have we can have um auxiliary members or interns or even guests participate in the decisions that are happening at the board with us and so it, it, it if we're looking at from the perspective of we're working with the collective intelligence to make sure that we're making decisions that aren't harmful for the organization and then having outsiders contributing to that is only interesting and good. It's like we're bringing in external expertise. And because the process is a protocol that's so tight, it doesn't actually waste time to have external with us in it. And so that's also interesting. So even though we have a board, we're always having um, flow of people moving through and from outside that are contributing to those board decisions. Nice, thank you. Um, let's see here. And I see a few questions about getting started in the chat and also about youth co-ops. And I just wanna throw out there that one, one option is also to start these, like if you're not legally incorporated yet, you can start building these practices and start practicing and kind of see what tests out what will make sense for your bylaws if, if you're not quite ready to incorporate. Or for youth co-ops, maybe the staff is a part of the worker co-op and the youth do a lot of the practices of the co-op, but they aren't formal members. They could be though, um, different ways that can look. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, we have a lot of really rich experience in this in this audience. Um, and I was wondering if anyone else would like to share from another co-op, would like to share your decision-making processes at your co-op and how that looks. So yeah, anyone wanna share? Yeah. 
you can hop on you can just hop in if you like no pressure though hi um so we uh, i am a part of collective uh, boston cleaning collective and massachusetts um so um we're collective so we are uh we don't have a board uh but uh we take decisions collectively um so we are small now so it's still working um no like i call it's changed we haven't changed anything of the um artist structure but um as um when we make a decisions, we have to um, find a consensus for from everybody. Excellent, thanks, thanks, Olalio. Nice to see you. Um, uh, and do you what kinds of decisions does your what the kind of what kinds of decisions go to that level like to the full co-op board? Do you kind of do you have like like I imagine like there are like things that are just kind of default like okay this is how we do things day to day. But, it, but like what kind of things go to the full call? Yes, yeah, so we have the operations decisions, right? You know, everybody's holding accountable for the position they play. Like uh, I do the administration piece, uh, the coordinators uh, do the operation day by day with the teams that they work. But per se, uh, you know, we have to buy a new car. Uh, or we need to purchase a big equipment, like uh, our big equipment can be like, you know, a new industrial uh, vacuum uh, for them to use. Uh, so that kind of decisions go to uh, everybody's uh, plate. Uh, when we meet um, in, a, in, a, you know, in a monthly basis for like what we call the governance, so if we need to purchase a truck, uh, a car, or we need to purchase a vacuum, or we need to look into, uh, you know, that our schedule is getting heavier, we need to figure it out if we wanna uh, bring another crew on board uh, to make sure that we need a truck, we need, uh, we need a car, we need, uh, you know, uh, one or two more vacuums, and then we need to make sure that we get all the supplies that to set it up the car for the new crew. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Lalio. Yeah. yeah. I feel like some of that could speak to the question and or the comment question in chat. Um, it, let's see here. We're just learning how to be a worker co-op and have a good group, but there's some clash between general manager and a basic collective philosophy. And does anyone have any relevant past experience in how to navigate this space? So I feel like some of that teasing out what goes under operations versus like like saying what what goes under operations versus what does the whole what does what does the whole co-op want to decide on can that having that discussion and writing it out could help and saying like here are our values and we are all on the same team we want to meet these we've agreed upon these goals and there are different ways to do it it's not like right or wrong necessarily it's more like how do we make work together to figure out a solution too, but um, Kate, yeah. Um, I'm gonna switch to Spanish again. So if folks are English speakers, make sure you're in the English channel of your interpretation. Um, I just wanted to say that one of the things that we do at our cooperative, we all have our bylaws but we can't be looking at these 18 pages and when we're in a meeting. So many times we forget that in a moment of conflict or a decision-making time, we forget how we had agreed to things in the statutes or the bylaws. So what we've done is create a guide that's one page that we always have present during our meetings. And this guide is a summary of how we are making decisions. So as Elalio said, if it's a larger purchase, we have to have X number of people present. And if it's a different type of decision, this committee or that committee can make that decision. And we did this in a document that's one page long, and we always have it on hand during our meetings. 
So at the moment of making a decision, we're not stuck and we have the paper in front of us. And so we have X number of people here so we can make this decision or we don't have enough people to have a vote. So let's make, pass that to the next meeting. And so this page has made it much easier for us to remember the rules that we had put into the, the bylaws for the cooperative, just like a mini guide is another way of describing it. What a fabulous tool. Thank you. That's really cool. Um, let's see her. Oh, yes. Uh, let's see her. Let's uh, I see Colin's hand as well. You want to uh, share something? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Can you hear me and turn my video on? Hi, hi, everybody. Thanks. This is very, really, really interesting. Um, I wanted to uh, maybe uh, highlight something you had said, Esther, in your earlier presentation, and maybe it speaks to the question that come up in the chat as well, which is the governance matrix. So I've worked at two worker co-ops, and it kind of just speaks to what you said just moments ago, Esther, about having knowing which bodies are made, made, meant to make which decision. I've worked with the governance matrix once at a co-op um, that actually bought it from Equal Exchange, or La Siembra co-op in Ottawa, where I worked. You might know, know the investor. Um, and now I work for another, another co-op um, that's about 25 people. Anyway, so I find that um, a having a uh, like sort of clarity around what decisions need to go to the full membership, what decisions need to be be live within management, and what actually could a board of directors if you have different bodies. Um, and probably most importantly, is to principle six, I've I've seen so many versions of different matrices matrices that uh, other co-ops have been willing to share, and Equal Exchange has generously shared it with us. Amber, and we are running into some of the same challenges. So I also think that um, the sharing of these one of the benefits of having these documents, these one pagers that Kate mentioned, is actually they're very, very easy to share and very easy to take inspiration from. So I just wanted to highlight that. I'm I'm a very very big believer in, in the matrix for what it's worth. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, and I'll just throw out there. I also believe in the power of like updating things too. So like, if your co-ops starting to run into issues, like say, I don't know, like say you have like founder syndrome or something like that, you can start like say articulating that as a maybe it starts in the member body and then goes to the board or vice versa. So there's some important things with governance around some topics and being able to be flexible. Um, I think I saw uh, someone wanting to jump in earlier. Um, let's see here. Did did uh, did anyone else, before we keep moving, did anyone else want to share what their co-op does? For governance? OK. Yeah, awesome. So just let me know, just, you know, shoot me a message or anything um, or in chat or put in chat. Can you guys hear me now or no? Yes. How do I raise my hand just for future reference? Okay, so. Oh, you're just gonna mute. Yeah, sorry, my house is a bit loud right now. I'll come back later. Oh, cool, yeah, it happens, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so um, great. So we have a lot of great questions here. And let's go to um, there's a question about quorum. Um, just to clear, let's talk about quorum for decision making for just a minute. Um, there's a question for Alex about what the threshold for quorum was and Smaller decision. It sounds like smaller decisions have seventy five percent quorum and one hundred percent for bigger decisions. Is that right? Uh, sorry if I was uh, explaining that uh, in a confusing way earlier. Um, in general, actually, Ben, could you speak to this a little bit?
Yeah, just in our bylaws, um, we we lay out like specifically which kinds of decisions need like um, unanimous a unanimous decision from our decision making body, which is just for the moment. It's just the four of us. Um, so, for instance, those are like decisions to bring on somebody new um, to work with as a worker owner. Um, and then there are other decisions that are kind of like less important, maybe to the whole co-op um, and those require, and then we have like a different, you know, percentage of, of uh, consensus that we need, but because there's only four of us, you know, it's kind of, there's, there's only four of us to, to split up, so. Thank you. Um, there's a question for those with a board, how do you, how do you balance the tension between expertise, representation of st stakeholders, and member voice in governance? That's a, I think that's a really important question. Like, how do you balance all these interests on a board? And I was wondering if anyone would like to speak to that. Let's see here. No thoughts. I'm sure someone has thoughts. Um, I'll share at Equal Exchange. We had like, and we had a, we had our board when I was there. We had a board of um, majority worker owners, and I think it was, I want to say like six worker owners, and then three outside board members, and then you had the two co-presidents on there too, um, who we oversaw and the board oversaw, and so. Um, yeah, we, so you, we, in that case, the, a tool that, or, you know, a method that can be used is to have majority worker owners on the board. So that is one, one way to do it. Let's see. Uh, there's a question. Um, can anyone speak to the pros and cons of sociocracy? Has any co-op here used sociocracy or something similar? Can we define sociocracy? What's that? I'm can we define sociocracy, you know, like, what does it mean right now? Because I, I think I have an idea what it means, but I'm not sure what it what we're using it, you know, what I mean, yeah. Do you want to go? I'm ahead? happy. To, yeah, I'm happy to jump into that because I'm really in the world of uh, self managing organizations and collective shared leadership and sociocracy is just um, more of a formalized system within that movement, as is holacracy. And um, I think when I think about it, I think that there's a, a few elements that are kind of cornerstones to functioning in a, a shared leadership model. So when we start looking at those those different elements that we were talking about in your in your decision making matrix or chart or whatever, and you have that management role, when when we start going into the the shared shared leadership structure, then it everybody well there's a that that management is shared so that's a bunch of roles so for example in our cooperative we have about 12 roles that um are stewarded so it's not like uh, they belong to anybody so we'll have like a financial caretaker the legal protector um impact grower and different roles like that that we would usually associate with management but they're all kind of separated out and then individuals steward them so you don't belong to them and at one point you can put them back in the center and they can move on to somebody else and we doesn't mean that you do the only work around them but you are holding the accountabilities that are associated with them. So you're really taking care of one of those aspects. And so sociocracy is a, is a formalized system for functioning in roles, but you don't need to adopt the sociocracy way to be functioning in a, in a shared management um, setup. And so I, I think that there's like in this whole movement of um, collective governance, there's ways of doing things that focus on the practices in such an emerging field, there's so many practices that are emerging and ways of doing things. From those practices, certain structural elements are kind of um, uh, landing. For example, I sometimes find that, so, that there's elements of sociocracy that can be a little bit like slow down and clunky. And so for us, we've 
opted out of some of them and are, are kind of morphing them or tweaking them or, or coming up with our own things where we can come because we're in um, in our work. I, I hope keep coming back to this like life and flow, keeping things in movement. And so how to do that in a collective space, that's what's really important for us. And sometimes sociocracy can be really interesting for like, I have a friend, for example, who's in a co-housing structure and sociocracy processes are like brilliant for it because it's really slow and really everybody gets a voice and it's something that's so close to you that's really great so I think everybody is in you know you can you can come to it as you want but that moment where you shift your management role and break it out into like a, a co-management structure is really like the interesting element in there and it it's it's built on um, good collective decision making processes. Thank you. That's great. Um, Abe, I saw in chat that Geo Grassroots Economic Organizing does some loose sociocracy. Would you want to share anything about how that looks? Sure, I can. I wouldn't say that we're the model of sociocracy. We're, you know, a small, you know, we kind of operate like a an affinity group, you know, we're very close, very small. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, so, you know, we have people with a consensus background, some people with a sociocracy background, and it kind of has ended up being a mush of them together. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't say we're the model of how to do it right. But um, yeah, we use that. Thank you. Um, well, I, I have a question for folks. Um, so, like we talked about some before, democratic decision making in our workplaces is not the norm in this country, right? In fact, it's very much not the norm. And it's often, like I've seen some co-ops have trouble because either uh, folks bring in this mindset of the individual owner and not collective owner versus a co-op or just kind of taking a backseat, like passive backseat. I'm like, we're just in this for the job. Let me do my owner. Let me just put on my, my worker hat and not the owner hat, right? So how do you, how, I, I was wondering if anyone could talk some about what that means for folks or what, what your co-op has experienced with onboarding people to come into this governance role. Hey, um, my thoughts are like, when it comes to co-ops, I think of them, you know how in America companies are like, because they're separate from people. And I like to think of that like a ship, right? Like a boat. So people, the, the sailors are the workers and the people who own the boat are like the uh, shareholders. But in, but in like a, on, in a democratic business, the sailors are the owners. So to, I guess that's how I think of it, right? Like it's almost like how pirates were, like pirates elected their captain and quartermaster. So they had control over the ship, but they also sailed on it. So like, that's how I would, that's my thoughts and I've had, and I, I had, uh, I'm, st I'm trying to help start a co-op in my neighborhood, but also I'm doing one online. The, the neighborhood one is a grocery store, but the one online is a more personal art based project. And for the art one, I'm much more progressed because I need, I need fewer materials, all I need are the people. And I've had the issue with people having a bit of trouble understanding that it's a very consensus, cooperative based thing, but it helped to, it helped to, it, the, the boat analogy really helped because it's like the boat, there's only one boat and everybody has to go the same way as the boat is going. But you, if you're on a, Crew that the captain listens or like the helmsman listens, everyone will have a say in which direction the boat goes. So it helped. And that also played into us forming a not only short term goals, but long term goals as well. Like the mission statement. When we wrote, I wrote out, I asked everybody, what do you want this company, where do you want this company to go long term, like a mission statement? Everybody got their opinions in. 
And luckily for, we were all in a general similar area. There were some that were a bit more business oriented, others that were more like um, politically oriented, others that were a bit more passion oriented, but it was a similar trajectory that I think will we'll do well. So I wrote a mission statement that fit in everybody's goals in a sentence. And then I elaborated on it. The reason I wrote it in a sentence is so that it wouldn't seem too convoluted and jumbled. And then I elaborated so we would have more to think about than just um, the sentence, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I love that ship metaphor. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts on that? Anyone else want to jump in? Or? Another, another thing that comes to mind is, to me, is the importance of being able to disagree. <laughs> um, so with governance, you inherently, like you have different opinions and you have to govern together, right? And I'm wondering, like to me, I think that there can be, oh, um, healthy, there can be healthy conflict and learning how to talk through things together that you disagree on or maybe want to figure out a better solution together on um, through dialogue and figuring things out together. Um, does, but, but then other times conflict, I think we aren't taught that a lot too. And so we can come into a co-op and there can be harmful conflict or, or you know, where it's not feel, it doesn't feel good to people, you know. So I'm wondering if uh, anyone wants to speak on that. Just got to, you know, does anyone have thoughts on that? Like conflict, the role of conflict and how to make it healthy and not unhealthy. I think that in the worst case where the conflict is becoming potentially triggering for people or maybe may result in a, a, a division that is so great that it may destroy the co-op altogether, I would say that in that case, you should start to reach out for a mediator. Um, and I can't really speak on how like anyone else might do that exactly as far as our network here in Philadelphia, because of our pre-existing relationships, we're connected with people and services that do that sort of thing. But in general, I would say that finding someone who is trustworthy with a good track record of dealing with conflict would be a good way to make sure that it does not become much more serious. But as far as having healthy conflict, uh, I'm really eager to hear more about that because that sounds like a, that's not the sort of sentence that I would hear normally, healthy conflict, but it sounds, it sounds nice. It sounds potentially very, very fruitful and, um, and also sometimes necessary. So I'll pass it on to you. Anyone else would like to speak on that? Thanks, Alex. Um, uh, Elliot, I see your hand up. Would you like to go? Yeah, thank you. I guess uh, just building on that, I maybe kind of reinforcing that question, but one of the reasons why I came is because I was curious about that kind of thing. Um, my background is I'm a professor at a business school and I'm always looking for ways to contribute to this community. Like I'm, really want to get involved in order to help um, support and foster cooperatives and these, this kind of business structure or organizational structure. Um, but I'm really curious about the ways to do that. And I, I was wondering if maybe that's one of, the, one of the things that people from who are not members of cooperatives could help cooperatives, like acting as mediators or, I really don't know, actually. <laughs> um, I also have a background in negotiation and, and conflict management. And so I was wondering if maybe that's, there could be something there that could be useful, um, but I'm curious, people who, who are you know, who are doing a living a life, if if that exists, are there, in a sense, like are there mediation co-ops, like like sort of like parrot co-ops, people who were involved in, in facilitating other cooperatives um, in order to uh, make that work. I see Samantha raise her hand, but yeah, it, yeah I'm really curious. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. I really want to let everybody speak, but I just, I just 
really want to say that, you know, when we talked about the two pieces that are the key elements for um, our governance system, I could have added the third, which we call circus, circle practice. It's not us, just call it. Circle practice is, for me, the key way of making peace with that conflict is part of life and being able to just embrace it with like, this is normal and to normalize it and not run away from it and kind of flip it to when we're experiencing attention, it's simply the gap between the current state and a potential. And so to be go into that tension with again, a protocol that can hold to release it and move to the next stage, circle practice for me is the way to do that. And um, yeah, I think it's to have a, a healthy governance uh, system. It's the key cultural element that's probably on most co-ops and organizations blind spot. And I'm quite surprised how many organizations when I show it to them are adopting it like as, as really like something that they're hungry for because it is, there's such a huge need for this. Yeah, and Matt Feinstein, Feinstein, you put a great list of facilitation co-ops in chat. So there are several that do that, um, but it always helps to keep growing, right? Um, it is in chat, and there are also, I wanna highlight, there are several awesome chats going on and resources, including a pirate party, I don't know. We'll see. Sorry, my lighting makes me look scary right now. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, um, so check out that chat for a lot of great resources. Um, next, uh, uh, let's call. Uh, let's go to Atsushi. Sure. Um, so this is Atsushi here. I posted the long post earlier. Sorry, I'm so verbose. Um, I also threw my back out, which is why I don't have my video on. I'm lying in bed because I can't move too well. But in any case, you know, um, um, you know, I guess. In, so on the question of conflict. I guess our issue right now, you know, again, we're sort of a new co-op, so a lot of folks don't understand cooperatives. And so it's actually that people are a, a flip, a conflict averse. And so they don't know how to bring issues up to, you know, conversation in, you know, a staff meeting, right? So, you know, um, oh, oh, you know, in other words, you know, we have these beautiful governance mechanisms in place but we're not at a place where you were using them to really sort of talk it through as a group of people working with a common, you know, cause and purpose, you know, so, you know, I'm not sure conflict is productive, but I think a willingness to, you know, bring issues to the table because there's something, you know, there's a disagreement or somebody's uncomfortable about something. I think that's important. And for me as, um, you know, general manager, and I, I love the comment I received from somebody in a private chat that, you know, we should consider changing my title, right? You know, I don't see my role as general manager so much as a facilitator to enable the kind of conversations that need to happen across the group, but I haven't found a way to bring that to life. And so our meetings are um, not so productive. Um, and I think that's keeping us from, you know, reaching, you know, attaining our potential. Um, you know, so I think, I don't know. Uh, just my thoughts on the conflict issue, I guess. Thank you. No, oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call on Daniel next because he had his hand up um, first. I'll call on you. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. This is Daniel. Um, I'm on staff at the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives in our training and consulting team. And I wanted to jump in in part because we do a lot of this work where we've done some conflict mediation for folks, but we do a lot of work to help people work through conflict. Right? And I wanted to bring together a couple different points that I'm, I'm hearing and, and share some practices too. One is just, um, Atsushi, towards your previous comment, right? If democracy is at the base of sort of the concept of worker cooperatives, if people don't feel comfortable saying no, you don't have a real democracy, right? Can't People can't actually give their consent to a process if they don't feel like they can give a full-throated yes or a full-throated no when they really mean those things, right? And so it's really important for us to, if we wanna have a functioning democracy, which is always a living practice, we need to make sure people feel comfortable doing that, right? And then taking into account things like power, positionality, as part of that across an organization with our racial identities, with our gender identities, with 
class, privilege, and position, all of those things, right? And then, of course, it gets more complicated when you start to ask, well, what information do people need? What environment do people need in order to be able to give that full-throated yes or full-throated no? To bring it back to some of the governance stuff and part of what Kate was talking about, it's part of why the governance work and being really clear about your decision-making model is so important and having it written down, right? So you can go back to it and say, this is what we all agreed to. We said that this is how we were going to make our decisions. And if people, if we're in conflict about that, right, we can revisit our governance. We can revisit those decision-making processes, right? But this is what we agreed to. So that's what we're going to use for now, right? So that there are standards if you want to think through how you might engage and get ready for a conflict before having those materials ready, a really simple way to do it is to just like take a meaningful amount of time with your fellow worker owners, with your collaborators, to just talk through like, how did you experience conflict growing up? What did you learn about conflict, right? How do you like being in conflict now? What is conflict that feels responsible, respectful, and healthy? so that we can disagree with one another and build upon one another's ideas in order to make a cooperative that's really going to work for everyone. Um, I want to lift up again that resource that Matt put into the chat. There's some really amazing stuff linked there. Um, and I also believe Aorta, um, who are a work cooperative, who do a lot of work around um, conflict, power, all that good stuff. I believe on their website, they have a tool that essentially helps people articulate. It's a nice little worksheet. How do you, how do I like to be approached? I how do I like to be approached when we're in conflict together, right? Understanding some people like physical distance is really important, or like don't wa wa wag your finger, right? Or maybe it's just like don't curse because that kind of language starts to make it feel more aggressive when we're disagreeing with one another, right? So understanding those things, having conversations about how power interplays with all of that before you have some of that stuff, right? You always just want to be you want to talk about it before conflict is actually there so that you can be grounded in the things. That you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate it. And just a heads up, we have 15 more minutes left. And I have Hazel and Wazir and Kate on stack. So Hazel, great to see you. Go ahead. Great to see you, Esther and everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on staff at the Canadian Worker Cooperation. And um, just want to shout out to Samantha for joining from Montreal. Thanks. Um, yeah, really, Daniel's just gave a lot of great info. And I don't want to repeat any of that kind of stuff. We do similar sorts of work at our federation, too. Uh, but anyways, um, the thing I wanted to just call out is I feel that if you have a good conflict, well, if you have a good decision making process in place and people trust it and grow to trust it, whatever it is that works for you, kind of the more consensus based, the better. I think people can just lean into that and grow to trust it over time. And, you know, cutting your teeth on like conflicts that are maybe not that huge, you know, is really helpful. And then you see, oh, this is a conflict and we recognize it's happening here and we just we like our process and it's not scary and we can just go through it together. I mean, it's not like it's going to be perfect, you know? I mean, there's all the issues of dealing with other humans and everything can come up, but um, I know, I just wanna personally speak to my uh, co-housing community, which uses a consensus-based decision-making process and it's awesome. And we're trying to implement more uh, pieces of sociocracy, but I think just the very fact of having consensus creates a lot of safety and to the degree you can, and it's not too disruptive to do, but anyway, um, that's my main point, I guess. And I have a question that I might just share in chat. So thanks. Thanks, Hazel. Uh, Wazir. I was, I was just going to mention um, the experience I've had with um, the little experience. Like, I'm not that, like, like um, sorry. I'm not that experienced with this process, but making sure that I've always been really good at helping my friends communicate by telling them they can, while they should make sure what they say doesn't offend anyone, they can say whatever comes to their mind. And that, and that having that like mentality with like the co-op I'm, I'm trying to form with the art one has really helped because Sometimes you got, sometimes people are, uh, somebody mentioned it, I forget who, somebody mentioned people are, you have the system, it's just people are somewhat averse to mentioning it for whatever reason. And having the atmosphere where you, sometimes you got to tell them that it's the atmosphere, but having the atmosphere 
where people feel safe and comfortable speaking their mind really does help. Now I'm, I'm again, I'm like super inexperienced, but, and most of us are in this, most of us in my group, I'm not talking about anybody else here. Most of us in my group are inexperienced. Um, so, but having that did very much help. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like that trust element is so key, you know, like building up that trust. And I think even that's where like social hour could come in and just getting to know each other in comfortable spaces too, you know? Um, okay, I'll pass it to Kay and then we'll go through some other questions on chat, on, uh, from the chat. Sí, cambiando al español. Este, solo quería invitar también a, a... Switch into Spanish. I just wanted to invite people speak in, to speak in Spanish because I know most of the people presenting today were speaking in English. So I know that sometimes when it's a conversation that's mostly in one language, we don't raise our voices as much. So I know that there's many veterans of the cooperative movement here in this call who speak Spanish as well. And we have interpretation both ways. So just inviting that if any colleague would like to share about their experience in the decision making process or if they have any questions, go ahead. Creo que podemos pasar a, a Dove, de hecho. <laughs> I think we can go to Dove for now, uh, talking about that. Voy a hablar en español. Yo ahora estoy en México. Okay, I'm going to speak in Spanish. I'm in Mexico. I think it's going to be easier for me. And I think that... I think the productive conflict is very important. But for it to be important, we have to be prepared to be able to transform a conflict into something productive. So it's not something that comes automatically. We just don't create it just like that. So you have to be prepared for that. So number one. So number two, it depends on who the people who are part of the cooperative and why are they members of the cooperative. Many times in Mexico, at least, and many other countries as well, people belong to a cooperative without really knowing what they're getting themselves into. Many times due to other motivations that might be very legitimate, like maybe obtaining a loan or to have economic or financial resources. So people get into cooperatives without being ready, without really knowing what they're getting themselves into. So in third place, many cooperatives that there's a very intense process of tr technical professional training. So training and education to be able to carry out in a better way what the cooperative has is its fundamental economic basis and what they're making their their living and many times they put much less attention to the cooperative training that continual training so we don't become cooperatives because we've been 20 years of experience and not that that's not important it is very important or because they were part of a course of cooperatives. So oh, I know what the cooperative is based on that class I took. So it's not only a technical knowledge, what the structure is, what's the decision making process, etc. It also has to do with a certain attitude in terms of society, with life, with work, with the community. And that's what we have to be working constantly. And even more with the board of directors, because sometimes the board of directors, if they're continuing in their own functions for a long time, 
the power, you know, does its own thing. And so when I get used to governing or directing, I like it. And if I do it well, that's the worst thing. No, I start to believe I'm indispensable, you know, so all of that all together, you have to take it into consideration to be able to transform the conflict into something productive, which is like the essence of how we make decisions in a cooperative society. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I really agree on the importance of ongoing and member education, which you alluded to, and appreciate your points. Um, and the engagement, like so many times uh, I've seen like, you know, members who have been there a long time not see the need to really keep act, like either keep active in decision making or like dynamic process. And it's still a dynamic co-op, so we're always growing, right? Um, I'm going to call out for, there's a question about youth co-ops, and there have been some good research, good points in chat regarding youth co-ops. And then there was a question about, um, it, it's uh, how do you scale decision making? How does it work with multi-stakeholder or many types of members? And I was wondering if um, anyone wanted to briefly address that, and then we'll turn it over to Kate. In a minute, <laughs> briefly, just briefly address that. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's a big topic, um, but yeah, uh, and then we'll turn it over to Kate uh, to close us up or uh, wrap us up. Samantha, would you want to take that? No pressure. The question about multiple stakeholders? And yeah, there's a kind of double two parts to the question, I guess, like the scaling up, maybe the scaling mm -hmm. up part. Yeah. Um, you know, my background is cultural anthropology, so my default um, response is always going to be have your cultural foundations anchored in and scaling up finds its way, right? Um, so, you know, that good decision making practice, whatever it is, make sure everybody has the shared language of it, you all understand it. So you can just like, do it in an easy way. And when somebody comes in new and you scale up, it's about this is the decision making practice that's going to scale across and through an organization. And if you have uh, really simple ways of making sure you're having transparency of what's happening and that practice of transparency and documenting and putting it down in very simple way, like, like a simple log, is really easy to scale it up. And then if you have your, your conflict practice, like a circle practice or whatever your conflict practice is, but internally is not, I mean, I think it's it's good to have, you know, being able to reach outside for, for external when things when things really go go bad, but to have it on a daily basis, those three can take an organization from something that's small of four people to 14 to 40 to whatever. And since we're talking about scaling up, there's um, there's a cooperative in Latin America that I would love to share with you all because it really wows me of how they have scaled up from a way of looking at decisions and saying, we can scale as long as we focus on the criteria of the decision and agreeing on the criteria versus agreeing on the actual thing. Because if you agree on the criteria, then people can go off and, and enact that criteria in a way that makes sense. It's in the criteria of what's valid. It makes the, it, it, it causes the friction. And so this, um, this co-op that's in Venezuela is, I don't, I'm not quite sure even how you pronounce it. I would love for somebody um, that has his Hispanophone to share, to, to, to pronounce it. But what they do is they have a way, they have hospitals, um, organizations of all different kinds, and they have scaled in a way of um, running things based on the simple principle of can we just focus on the criteria that underlines this decision rather than the specifics of the decision. So um, I, yeah, that's what I'd like to talk to, to leave with is like a Latin American inspiration. Thank you, awesome, appreciate that. Um, let's see here. So I think we're out of time, but I really appreciate, this has been really, I really appreciate everyone and your contributions and in both the dialogue and the chat. There's so many great resources and so much experience here. So thank you everybody. 
And I'd like to pass it over to Kate now to close us out. Thank you. I'm going to switch to Spanish. Thank you to Esther and to everybody who shared their experiences. As we said now, there's no way to manage a worker cooperative as that specific way. It depends a lot on the size, the political perspective, the type of industry, the locality and then there are many others and you can also always count on the support of this network to be able to explore more the types of governance that you're trying to implement in your cooperative always send us your questions we're always uh, available through email info at aroba at usworker.coop you can send us your questions, your comments, your ideas, your feedbacks, your constructive criticisms. Uh, and we're there to be able to answer questions and to be able to support you in the development of your cooperatives. So just to share a little bit, this is not the only space where we're gonna be meeting in these months. We have some events that are coming up for people who are arriving or who are just starting your project or your cooperative. We have a space every month where people can get together about how to develop your cooperative. It's a space like more basic for people who are starting in the initial stages. And this next month is gonna be on Friday, April 1st. And for people who are members, we have a council for advocacy. If you're interested in the work that's in terms of advocacy for worker cooperatives, the next meeting is on Thursday, April 7th, for members who are interested in the labor and union movement you can join that call of policy and advocacy. Oh, I'm sorry, it's on Friday, April 8th. And our next stage, like this is part of a series that we're sharing among membership around different issues on uh, co-op development, fundamentals of democracy at work. And the next one, the next session is focused on founder compensation. So if you have a larger membership and so people created the cooperative, we're gonna be talking about how to have some kind of compensation for founders. And so we're gonna have that in about a month on Wednesday, April 20th. And our last thing, we'd like to invite you. Many of you have membership with the Federation through your cooperative, but we also invite you for people who are interested in this work to join as monthly sustainers. And if you would like to join as a monthly sustainer, you can do that in our main webpage, which is usworker.coop or COOP, and that's where you can sign up to make that monthly donation. So thank you to be here today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.